Yes. There so is. joining us right now, he is the director of Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil, and Vile, which is premiering on May 3rd on Netflix. Joe Berlinger is here. Hello, Joe. How are hey. you? Hey. Nice to nice have to, you. Nice to be here. Sure. Um, if you want to put those on, you can. It's easier here, but if you don't have to. Yeah, you know, it always, yeah. always distracts <laughs> you. Now you don't know they're clapping for you, though. Yeah, oh, they're, they're, they're clapping. <laughs> you got to hear that. There, there, go. there it is. Thank you for joining us. Hey, my pleasure. Really appreciate it. And it's funny because Mark Riley, he lo- he's big. He's a true, true crime guy. Cool. Huge. And uh, the, com- the Confessions of a Killer, the, the Ted Bundy tapes, cool. is incredible. I have mixed feelings about that true c- true crime moniker that's la- yeah. labeled that I'm labeled with. How come? Yeah. Um, you know, I am like I embrace it as much as I wince at it. Um, well, you know, true crime kind of conjures up the image that we're wallowing in the misery of others uh, for entertainment purposes. And I'd like to think that a lot of my explorations of crime and others, I'm not the only one, mm-hmm. um, you know, has an element of social justice right, yeah. to it. You know, wrongful convictions with Paradise Lost yeah. or, you know, uh, shining a light on victim advocacy as in the Whitey Bulger film or, you know, stuff I've done in some of my TV series like Killing Richard Glossop. There's a guy in Death Row that... I think is innocent and the state has tried to kill him three times. So my focus on crime, I would like to think, is not just some of the lower end scale of things that we all call true crime. Right. right? It's not it's not it's not the reason that you watch these reality television shows. It's more so because you're trying to be informational. You're trying to get the certain things that maybe we didn't know. Right. And so let me ask you, why do you why did you choose to get into this? uh, No, in general. Oh, in general first, yeah. Well, you know, honestly, I wish I could say I had this great social justice mission right from the get-go, but back in the uh, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, I think there were a handful of documentarians doing different things to expand the form. You know, Errol Morris was expanding the form through, you know, recreations and taking that to the next level and making documentaries very cinematic-looking. Michael Moore, of course, was, you know, filmmaker on camera as social curmudgeon, you know, (laughs) advocating for social justice. I mean, I think what Bruce and I were doing with Brothers Keeper, there really was no social justice component yet. We were just trying to expand the definition of what what a documentary is. And in Brothers Keeper, you know, we did things that hadn't been done before. We had an evocative opening title sequence, which now we take for granted. Right. You know, we ha- we used a music score uh, throughout the entire film. And in fact, documentarians back then, the leading documentarian said, oh, you can't have a music score in a documentary because that sh- tells that ca- that telegraphs how to think and feel. Right. And that doesn't that means a documentary is not objective. But my feeling is all filmmaking is very subjective, whether you're, you know, w- you know, the many hours you leave on the floor of the edit room, you know, a film is a thousand subjective right. decisions. So it, let's embrace the subjectivity. That doesn't give you the license to do things that aren't truthful when you're making a documentary. You can't put words into people's mouths. You right. can't put right. fake facts up there. But a film is, you know, a documentary to me is the emotional truth of a subject, not the literal truth. The literal truth of Paradise Loss is sitting through weeks of my dailies of the murder trial. That's right. the literal truth. You're, you're trusting the filmmaker to give you the emotional truth of a situation. So why can't we use the tools that other narrative filmmakers use? Again, you're constrained in some areas. You can't, you know, manipulate chronology to the point where it's unreal or to put words into people's mouths. It's but not based on a true story, this, this particular right, one. Right, right, right. right. So, um, so we were kind of pushing um, the narrative form with Brothers Keeper, and we chose a murder trial because a murder trial has perfect dramatic structure. It has a beginning, a middle, and end. It has two antagonists, vi- or antagonists and a protagonist vying for the truth, and at the end, they're each changed. That's the classic definition of drama. So I kind of gravitated towards crime more for aesthetic purposes, and that brought us into Paradise Lost. And when we started making Paradise Lost, we thought we were making uh, a film about guilty teenagers because all the press coming out of Arkansas, these guys had just been arrested and we went down to cover it seven months before their trials. And all the press coming out of Arkansas was that these guys were were guilty on a scale of one to 10. The evidence was an 11, said the prosecutor. Uh, each night on the TV news, there was a confession, which we now know is bogus, but there was a confession printed in the newspaper. So we thought we were going down to make a film about guilty teenagers. And it wasn't until three months into embedding in that community, about four months before the trial started, 
that we got access to the West Memphis Three for the first time, interviewed them, and something, you know, one plus one wasn't equaling two. It just felt like something was off. And then that kind of began our thinking, well, maybe they're innocent. And by the time uh, Damien Eccles was chained up and led off to death row at the end of Paradise Lost, that's when the social justice gene you know, awakened in me, mm -hmm. when I realized that, oh, wait, we just experienced the most unbelievable miscarriage of justice right. where three guys were convicted for these devil-worshipping murders based on their musical taste in Metallica and liking Stephen King books, and there was no forensic evidence. And that's when it kind of... It's like of, a witch hunt. Exactly. Yeah. And that's when, that's when the light bulb went off, and I said, wait, I can use film, we can use film to shine a light on injustice and in, in the criminal justice system. So I just kind of stumbled into yeah. it. But, uh, you know, it's kind of been a calling ever since. Well, and obviously, I mean, you, and there's three, and there's a total of three now Paradise Lost. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, so you, three of those. And But the one thing that I think about, too, just hearing you talk about this, obviously there's a social justice uh, element to it. But it, the other thing, though, is because you're in the crime element, you know, you have to see. I mean, it's like police officers. You see the worst in humanity. Yeah. I mean, you really, especially now with the, the Ted Bundy stuff. Like, does yeah. that does that mess your brain up though a little bit? Does that make too? me a twisted dark dude? <laughs> uh, I don't know about that. Yeah, <laughs> makes me makes me a cautious parent. Yeah, yeah. right. That's that's and more of what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, and in fact, uh, yeah, I have stared into the abyss of evil. You know, more more than I care to, and it's exactly why I wanted to do both of these Bundy projects because yeah. the Bundy, the lessons of Bundy cannot be overstated, which are, you know, he defies all stereotypes of what we think a serial killer is. We want to think a serial killer is some strange looking, awkward social outcast that's on the periphery of human the human condition because that makes us feel comfortable that, you know, he's easy, you know, a serial killer is easily identifiable as a total weirdo and therefore you can avoid them. But the truth about Bundy and many people who do evil whether it's a priest who commits pedophilia and then holds mass the next day, or whether it's you know a corporate CEO responsible for the oxycotton and opioid epidemic, and they all repressed research and told their sales force to tell doctors the opposite. I mean, I'm sure those guys have wonder a wonderful circle of friends and people that love them and admire them. But that's also compartmentalized mm -hmm. evil in my book. And the lessons of Bundy is that the people you least expect. You know, and most often trust, like a priest uh, who then does evil, or a serial killer who's actually a, a good guy in appearance. You know, I mean, Bundy was, had a live in girlfriend who, right. played by Lily Collins, Elizabeth Cluffer. You know, Bundy had a live in girlfriend who thought he was a fantastic guy. And, and by all accounts, he was a good guy to the people around him. That's why they couldn't believe that he was capable of such a thing. So for me, the lessons of Bundy you know, can't be overstated for the next, you know, for my daughter's generation. You know, I have two daughters who are in the prototypical Bundy victim age range of, you know, college kids. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, they never heard of him. <laughs> and so, I, you know, I, that was the first thing when I called them up. I said, hey, did you ever heard Ted Bundy? Ask your friends. And n none of them really knew who he was. Right. And I think in this era of Internet catfishing and people – even on the positive end of things, we're all guilty of curating, not all of us, but I'm guilty. You know, we curate our lives on social media, on Instagram, and obviously they are truthful portraits on the one hand, but we're all trying to put the, you know, the best foot forward and so take that to the next level. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of people, a lot of internet predators out there, a lot of people who aren't what they're cracked up to be, and uh, that's the lesson of Bundy is just because somebody is white, good looking and charming doesn't mean you should trust them right on that note going back to the live-in girlfriend because i i saw the movie and i was really blown away by some of the choices that you made i'm curious on your opinion on some things because i don't know where you lie where it comes to bundy and liz do you feel like she ever at any point knew what was going on didn't know what was going on do you feel like we should judge her for not being aware of the situation what did you think about oh, their yeah. relationship i mean we should absolutely not judge her she's a victim and she's portrayed as a victim in the movie i think that's the that's what's so pernicious about these types of situations is that people present themselves 
in a certain way. You know, for example, a lot of people have talked about, gee, how could those parents have let their kids be with Michael Jackson? So I don't know mm-hmm. if you've seen Leaving ne- Neverland. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, to me, I'm not critical of those parents. I'm, you know, Michael Jackson presented him in such a way that he was believable and trustworthy. That's the power that somebody like a Bundy or a Michael Jackson has over people. In fact, you know, in that courtroom at the end of the movie when John Malkovich is sentencing Bundy to death for his extremely wicked, shockingly evil and vile acts, he's also taking the time to say, hey, I have no animosity towards you and I wish you would have, you know, gone a different way, partner, and I would have loved to have you practice in front of me because you would have made a good lawyer. Could you imagine if that was a person of color who had committed these crimes? He would be in chains and an orange jumpsuit, and they would be throwing the book at him. And so Bundy, even in his moment of being sentenced to death, has this hold over people. So I definitely don't think Liz should be criticized. I think she should be empathized with, and that's why I kind of put the movie through her point of view so that we can understand how we can become a victim to this type of psychopath. When, sorry, when, when I hear you the way that you, I mean, I think, I, I was very familiar with Ted Bundy, obviously, because I remember the Mark Harmon movie back in the day. Uh, that was the first time, when I, because I was very young when I saw it, and it terrified me because like that's that was the first time I recognized as a child that mm. that type of evil was out in the world. Yeah. But hearing you discuss um, kind of the, what Ted Bundy was, how he was essentially a really good actor, yeah. really. Then I that that was this is by accident by the way that, that he's that he's there today. Um, but the Zac Efron, the hearing you, that seems like almost why you would cast Efron, right? Because he does he seems like the last person in the world that would do something like this. A hundred percent. I mean, you know, some people have said, oh, it's stunt casting. You're you're hiring you know Zac Efron. Well, what's the stunt? He's portraying somebody who is charming and likable, and that people you know, uh, want to believe. And that's who Bundy was. And if Zach didn't have the goods to deliver, like I think he did an amazing job uh, performance-wise. So he delivered. So if he didn't deliver the goods and he was just kind of doing a Baywatch thing, um, you know, not to knock that film, just not, Different my, movie. Just not, yeah. just not yeah. my, th- my, my movie, um, you know, then maybe people could have the criticism. And people have said, oh, you're glorif- not some. Not not all, not some as oh you're glorifying Bundy by making him charming and good looking. No, he was charming and good looking. People went up to, went to his Florida trial, still not thinking he he was g- guilty of these things. And so, um, Zach was my first choice, and Gladys said yes. Um, and the fact that he was willing to even do this movie meant that he was taking a 99 percent pay cut because this was a small indie movie. So demonstrative of his commitment to wanting to do something different. Um, And also, since I'm mainly known for my documentaries, the idea that um, Zach in real life for a certain demographic has that hold over people. He can, there are certain, there's a large number of of young women out there for whom Zach can can do nothing wrong Mm -hmm. in real life. That's his persona. And so as a documentarian, to take that idea and bring that piece of reality into a movie, for me, just felt like I had some, some, you know, real life clay to play with. What about his preparation? Because I would imagine it's very complicated to prep for a role who is the good guy. He's portraying himself as this amazing guy, but he has all these layers of the onion that he has to peel back. It's got to be very different than if you're the typical villain in a movie. Yeah. How did you guys uh, well the thing that? the thing we spent the most time on um, in rehearsal and I'm not a like big rehearsal person. I, I kind of like to let things happen when we're actually making the film. So rehearsal for us is just sitting around the table and just talking about the scenes, uh, you know, and what their meaning is. Um, <clears throat> so for us, we spent a lot of time talking about. Uh, how much the the relationship between Zach and Lily needs to f- be real, you know, that you're not deceiving her in certain moments, that you're that you actually care about her, you know, and that for uh, initially he had a hard time, uh, uh, you know, with that idea, but um, you know, I believe that, and this is controversial. I think all people are. This is not excusing the guy. He's a horrible person. 
But I think all people are capable of love depending on how you define love. Love can also be extremely needy and selfish. And I think... Was that Zach's problem with, with the fact that, he, that we were giving this guy any bit of kind of... Uh, yeah, he, he, was, he was having a hard time wrapping his head around and we worked through it and he, and he, and he nailed it tremendously, you know, like, you know, the idea that he could actually love her. So you believe he did really, truly love her? It depends how you define love. I mean, you know, love is could be... Love as a selfless act, no, but love as a deep need for uh, normalcy and a connection to another human being, yes, I do believe he loved her. That's that's why he didn't kill her. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. Was she ever in harm? Like, do, do they know if she was ever in harm? Uh, there was a couple of it. There was um, he, at one point he she felt that he tried to like leave the house and block the door and closed the damper to the fireplace and mm-hmm. that he was attempting to kill her um, in a moment of weakness. Um, you know, we chose not to put that in the movie because the compression of time is very different in real life than in a movie. You know, if, if it's like if you're living with a drug addict or you're living with a cheater or you're living with somebody who has a fault, you know, over a six or seven year period, if there's a couple of incidents every six months, you tend to dismiss those and you don't put all the pieces together until you really emotionally recognize what's going on, which is what that hallway scene Mm. is at the end of the movie. Mm. Right. Um, In a movie, which is a hour and 50 minutes long, time is a very different thing. And if I were, there were a couple of things in her memoir, for example, she found a knife in his glove compartment. They kept separate apartments but lived together, basically. But once at his apartment, she found a cup full of keys that she didn't recognize, house keys. Um, The moment you put those things into the movie in in the first 10 or 15 minutes, it's impossible to ask the audience to then relate to their relationship. And so I chose to leave a few things out because, you know, again, if you're living with an alcoholic, a drug addict, a cheater, an abuser, you know, unless it's every day, you tend to push those, that bad information away until the moment that it all comes together. Um, so she did have a few, few more clues in her memoir than the movie indicates, but I felt like the most important thing for me is, to, is, is for the audience to buy the relationship, to in fact intellectually suspend the knowledge that you're walking into a Bundy movie. Of course, you know you're walking into a Bundy movie, but while the movies on the first half of the movie is unfolding, I want people to relate to them, to relate to the relationship, so you can experience what what the people who are deceived are experiencing, and so that in fact when he jumps out the window and escapes, which I hope I'm not spoiling. It's in the trilogy. Yeah, it's in the trilogy. Um, yeah. Right. So it's in the. Uh, thank you. Um, so when he jumps out the window to escape. Um, I almost want the audience to be rooting for that relationship, rooting for the for the two to get back together so that by the end of the movie when he finally admits to her in that final death row scene w- that he's actually done these things, even though she intellectually knows it, it's the first time she emotionally puts it all together, I want the audience to have that same sense of revulsion and disgust that she has because I want I literally want people to say, oh my God, I was rooting for Zach jumping out the window, but ugh, what a horrible person. And then to have that same experience right. as the character. I have so many questions about <laughs> I this. Know. I have so it's... many. The, the scene at the end that you're describing, mm. and I don't want to spoil completely how it goes about, but is that what happened? Is that how she finds out what he's done? Honestly, in the memoir, it was a phone call. Mm. It, I, I amped it up to be on, on death row. Um, and, and it was a phone call in which he admits to her? Yes. Mm-hmm. Interesting. That's, that's kind of the, from the, the confession tapes and the, the, the conversations with the killer, and you're presenting Ted Bundy as a monster. Yeah. When you're going into this movie, it, was, it a, was it hard for you to humanize him? Like, how did you go about switching your brain over from the documentary to this? Because now hearing you talk about what you're trying to do with Zac Efron and his character for all of us to root for Ted Bundy. Did you get any pushback from that, from like Netflix or, or anything like that? Or Oh, no. I mean, first of all, Netflix didn't come along until after the movie was done and they Got bought it. it at Sundance. So basically everyone was bidding on the final cut of the movie, um, which was good. Um, <laughs> but uh, was it hard to humanize? Um, I think that's 
you know, that's a funny word, and I think it gets confused with glorify, and some people have said, oh, you're glorifying Bundy, and I think that's like a knee-jerk misunderstanding of the human condition Mm -hmm. and and not, you know, again, as a guy who has spent 25 years really covering crime, you know, I believe that there is one spectrum of human behavior. You know, we want to think that serial killing is like some aberrant thing on the far fringes of humanity, which on the one hand, obviously it is. That's a, you know, most people aren't serial killers, but there's one spectrum of compartmentalized evil. And, and by that, I mean, you know, we've all had a boss who's a jerk to, to the underling and, but night and presents a nice face to their boss. You move along the spectrum, you got, you know, the CEOs of fossil fuel companies denying climate change, but they know what the impact is. The Oxycontin example I gave before, you know, you got a, you got people, you know, causing 200,000 opioid epidemics, uh, uh, opioid deaths in the, in the worst drug epidemic we've had, and yet they're good guys and they function, you know, they're not evil all day long. Right. <laughs> then you got the serial killer who or anybody who does true evil often presents a positive face. And so that's, so humanizing them is not condoning or forgiving them. Humanizing them is treating people and portraying people the way they really are as a cautionary tale to others that just because somebody looks and acts a certain way, you shouldn't trust them. I thought you nailed that. Yeah. I really did. I'm curious also about the relationships because you portrayed Liz one way and Carol Ann a completely different way in this movie. Do you feel more for Liz than you do for Carol Ann, who is his later partner? Um, They are portrayed differently. Um, Carol Ann, I felt, was much more manipulated by Ted and was opportunistically being used by him. So that was part of the portrayal. Um, I think she also was, um, her cluelessness as to the reality, I think is, is um, a little more clueless than, than Liz. I think Liz had a good reason. She only saw the good side of him. Um, but not bad. You're, you're not judging her either. Oh, not you at just all. think she was oblivious. Not at all. It's, it's, all, it's all about the power that... Um, that this guy had over even during this trial she she was seduced and manipulated by him and then we hear about the fact that and something that the public knows that they have a child exactly. together did you ever explore going down that road who is ted bundy's daughter and where is she now uh we we did look into it and we got you know we got the distinct message that these people want to remain anonymous and so and they've changed their names and they're hard to find and they haven't given given interviews in a long long time so you didn't <clears throat> actually talk to them so we did not and, yeah. and, and but somebody's got to be keeping it i mean just kind of because of dna you got to someone's got to be kind of keeping an eye and seeing if anything's wrong there though right I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. That's okay. a hard That's one. A, That's yeah. a hard one. You know, we reached out question. to a bunch of victims' families, and they made it clear that, you know, um, it was more intrusive to interact and talk to us than than not. And so, you know, some, some you know, Kathy Kleiner and I, have, who is one of the surviving victims of the Kayamega attacks, mm. you know, she and I have had a nice dialogue. Carol Duranch and I, have, you know, she actually appeared in conversations with the killer. Some people don't want to be bothered not bothered they don't they don't want the the trauma to be revisited and others were more willing to talk so well the movie once again guys it is extremely wicked shockingly evil and vile it premieres may 3rd and that is on netflix joe berlinger the director thank you so much for for joining us really appreciate